OK, excellent. We have a recording going now. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. So like I said, my name is Sean Ferguson, and I am a program officer in the Division of Preservation and Access at the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you for coming to today's webinar on the Preservation Assistance Grant for Smaller Institutions Funding Program. Thanks also to my colleague, Senior Program Officer Jacqueline Clements, who will be assisting me with Q&A today. I also want to thank your ASL interpreters who will be providing sign language interpretation throughout the session. Today we'll go over what Preservation Assistance Grants or PEG can fund, share some examples of previously funded projects, and go over how you can apply for an award. I'll offer some suggestions for writing a good application and answer some frequently asked questions. That should leave us with plenty of time to discuss a few of your own project ideas and answer any of your specific questions. Please type your questions into the chat box, which Jacqueline will be monitoring during the presentation. And note that closed captioning is available. Uh, I entered the information in the chat, um, but to say it out loud as well, click on the three dots at the top of your screen, then select turn on live captions at the bottom of the options window. This webinar will also be recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the video on YouTube in the coming weeks. The Preservation Assistance Grant Program is administered by NEH's Division of Preservation and Access, which is one of the seven divisions and offices that run grant programs at NEH. We recognize that in smaller organizations, implementing preservation needs may happen incrementally. Therefore, this program is designed to cover a wide range of needs to encourage repeat applications and to support a combination of preservation activities. At its heart, the point of this program is to enable small and mid-sized organizations to bring in outside experts in conservation and preservation to provide advice, help develop preservation plans, and build institutional capacity. For those institutions who have never had one, we often recommend starting with a general preservation assessment by a qualified consultant whose preservation skills and expertise are related to the types of collections that are the focus of your project. For instance, you may require a conservator with a specialty in objects or paper or paintings. Similarly, you will want to find a consultant who is knowledgeable about the preservation of collections in your type of institution, whether a library, archive, museum, or other cultural heritage organization. These assessments give organizations a roadmap with the steps they'll need to take to improve the physical care and intellectual control of their collections. Assessments also provide recommendations for preservation supplies and equipment, such as acid-free storage boxes, archival photo sleeves, archival shelving, or environmental monitoring equipment, such as data loggers or light meters, which may also be purchased with PAG awards. This program can also fund more specific consultations with preservation and conservation professionals, such as a digital preservation assessment, a conservation assessment, and the development of disaster preparedness and response plans. Finally, institutions may also request funds through a general PEG request for education and training in preservation and collections care for their staff and volunteers. As you can see on this slide, PEG awards are up to $10,000. Your project may take up to 18 months to complete, beginning as early as September 1st in the year that you apply. Funding requests can be for any or a combination of these activities. And except for the special circumstances I'll elaborate in a couple of slides, I want to say this and I'll say it a couple times, conservation treatment and digitization or other methods of reformatting are not eligible expenses in this program. Now, one new component you will see in this year's program guidelines is the inclusion of physical digital storage media for preservation of your digital collections. While digital preservation assessments have been in the program for a while and storage media such as external hard drives, NAS and LTO systems were not explicitly excluded, we are taking the step this year to clarify their inclusion as an eligible request. Just like with cabinetry, shelves, and other storage furniture to help preserve your physical collections, 
requests for digital storage media must be based on a digital preservation assessment, plan, or consultation. These items are also for the preservation of your current digital collections. You cannot ask for digital storage as part of a current or upcoming digitization project. Remember, and I'll say it again, remember that digitization is not a normal eligible expense, and in the next slide, I'll talk about the one exception. If you do request funding for digital storage, ask yourself if you have the expertise to manage digital preservation storage. If you need training or consulting to implement the storage properly, work with a digital preservation specialist. This is exactly what we recommend in our guidelines for physical storage and environmental monitoring projects as well. It is also important to note that cloud-based services are not eligible in PAG. Along with our regularly allowable activities, PAG has one special encouragement. If your organization's collections have recently been, been impacted by a hurricane, flood, wildfire, derecho, or other natural disaster, and reside in a federally declared disaster area, you may request funding for response, recovery, and mitigation activities, such as conservation treatment, temporary storage or relocation, and the purchase of cleaning equipment or remediation supplies. When appropriate, you may also request funding for reformatting as a preservation method. Again, these activities are only eligible for those in federally declared disaster areas, but they can also be combined with any of the activities that I just discussed in the previous two slides. To get a better sense of the kinds of projects funded through PAG, there are a few examples. Elizabeth City State University in North Carolina is one of them. They received an initial award supporting a general preservation assessment of the university archives documenting the history of one of the nation's oldest historically black colleges and universities. Based off this assessment, they subsequently received four more PEG awards to fund the purchase of archival shelving for different parts of the collection, including manuscripts and publications, photographs and film negatives, and items housed in cold storage. This is an example of a case where the institution, Elizabeth City State University, is large or larger but the unit within it, the archives, is small. So this is one of those cases where it's really appropriate for this applicant as the unit within the organization that's small to be applying. Now, another example, the Karuk Tribe of California received an award to purchase environmental monitoring and preservation supplies and train staff in their use to support the collection's care of necklaces, clothing, historic photographs, and basketry that document the pre-contact life and culture of the tribe, which are housed in the Karuk Tribe People's Center. The Chicago Film Archives hired a consultant to perform a digital preservation assessment, which provides recommendations for how best to preserve born digital and digitized collections. The project also resulted in a digital collections policy for the archives, over 25,000 and growing collection of films, prints, videotapes, audio tapes, and ephemera reflecting life in the Midwest between 1903 all the way to the late 1990s, which now amount to over 20 terabytes of data. In 2017, the General Archives of Puerto Rico experienced severe damages caused by the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, including impacts from water and humidity that were unable to be addressed for months due to building damage and continued power outages. The Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, which oversees the collection, took advantage of our special encouragement for those in federally declared disaster areas and received an award to assess, conserve, and rehouse bound volumes of compiled manuscripts recording the proceedings of the Municipal Council meetings of the City of San Juan from 1730 to 1900. Now, these are just a few examples of the types of projects that can be funded through PAG. For more examples of successful projects to help inspire your own institution, I recommend checking the Division of Preservation and Access blog on NEH.gov for posts on previous PAG awardees. In the past year, we've, we've added a few new stories, and we also have our 50 States of PAG series, which celebrates a PAG awardee in every state.
Now that you have an idea of the kinds of activities that can be funded, let's go over who can apply and how. Applicants must be either US nonprofit organizations, specifically 501c3s. They can also be institutions of higher education, state and local government agencies, or federally recognized tribal governments. Individuals and foreign and for-profit organizations are not eligible to apply. Applicants must also show that they care for and have custody or responsibility for the collections that are the focus of the application. They also have to have at least one staff member or full-time equivalent, paid or unpaid, and make their collections available for research, education, or public programming purposes. I recognize now that it's also 3.15, and so I'm gonna to pause to allow for our interpreters to switch over. So just one moment while we take that pause. Okay, I see that we have our, our second interpreter. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, how smooth was that? Okay, one additional point of clarification that I'll add to this slide, because we get this question so frequently about having at least one staff member or full-time equivalent paid or unpaid. Uh, this really means that you have enough people contributing to the work of the organization, um, whether they're paid or unpaid, part-time or full-time, totally volunteer, that equal like one person's effort into the collections. Um, so you don't just need one full-time staff member, or rather that's not the only way to achieve a status of having the equivalent of one person contributing to the work of the collections. Now, moving on, I want to point out that along with our programmatic encouragements, we also want to encourage certain institution types and communities to apply. That includes small and mid-sized organizations that have never applied to NEH for an award, like community colleges as well, tribal colleges and universities, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, Native American tribes, and Native Alaskan and Native Hawaiian organizations, as well as other collecting institutions whose humanities collections highlight historically underrepresented communities. If your organization does not line up with one of these areas, you should absolutely still apply. The encouragements are meant to signify particular interests of ours. However, they are not meant to privilege certain types of projects or applicants over others. It's important to note that our review criteria doesn't take this encouragement into account. Um, and so please, all organizations are welcome to apply. We are simply signifying uh, an encouragement from applications from organizations such as these. Now, by now, you are probably wondering what you need to include in your proposal. Knowing that most of your applicants are our applicants to this program are in small organizations, we try to make the application process as straightforward as possible. The main component of a PEG application is the project narrative. This is a five page single space document where you will describe your collections and the activities you would like to undertake and answer the questions that help address the review criteria. Before sitting down to write your narrative, you may want to do some information gathering with colleagues, audience members, or other stakeholders. Get a good sense of your organization's mission, the scope and content of your collections, your audience, and what you provide for them. If the general public is a large portion of your audience, think about how that breaks down. Are there genealogists, families, lifelong learners? Think about K through 12 schools, universities, professors and students. Uh, now also make sure that you gather some numbers to help illustrate your case. How many visits do you get a year? What about research requests? Can you clearly quantify your collections? Those numbers can say a lot when they go up to our panel of reviewers. And be sure you have a good sense of previous preservation work as well as you know, established priorities. This should make the writing a bit easier. It is OK to format your narrative in a short answer approach, listing the questions as they appear in the Notice of Funding Opportunity or NOFO, and then your response. It is also important to be clear up front regarding for what activities you are seeking funding. Then you will want to describe the content and size of the humanities collections that are the focus of the project, how they are currently used, 
and how the proposed project would increase access and use of said collections. Now tell us why your collections are significant locally and regionally and ways that they may fit in with national themes in American history. I will say that including some interesting and specific examples from within your collection will help strengthen your case. It's very important that the applicant make sure that when they're talking about that humanities significance, they're being specific about the collections. Now you will then need to describe the nature and mission of your institution and state whether your organization has ever received a preservation or conservation assessment, as well as the importance of the project to your institution. Finally, you will want to discuss the project staff and consultants and their qualifications. For those applicants who are applying under the special encouragement for disaster response, you can use up to one more page to answer additional questions found on PDF page 10 of the NOFO related to how the disaster impacted your institution and caused risk or damage to your collections. In addition to the narrative, we ask you to include some supporting information to bolster your case for funding. All applicants must submit a budget and budget justification, which is a written explanation of the line items in your budget. If your project includes voluntary cost share, which is expenses of the project that you're not asking NEH to cover, but rather you would be covering yourself, this is where you would indicate it in that budget justification. Your total on your budget form, though, should be equal to your total request from NEH. Another requirement is the inclusion of a detailed work plan where you outline the specific steps to achieve your project's goals. You may want to format this as a bulleted list or table. A monthly or quarterly breakdown is often a helpful level of detail, and you may also want to make note of who's working on what. Also, don't forget to build in a little padding time. If reasonable for your project, we recommend requesting the full 18 months allowed for the project. After the last few years, we all know that unexpected emergencies arise and shipments can arrive late, causing unexpected delays to your project. Finally, all applicants must include resumes or CVs for the staff and consultants participating in the project. Applicants who are requesting funds for a consultant must also include a letter of commitment from said consultant, and we highly recommend that applicants requesting only supplies or equipment include the previous assessment on which the request is based. While not required, other supporting documents, including workshop descriptions, supporting materials for disaster-related activities, and other documentation are encouraged. Please limit your additional documentation to 10 pages, and be sure to consult the application component table in the NOFO for a full list of forms and documents that must or may be included in your application package. As you prepare to compose your application, I highly recommend reading the sample narratives we have listed on the program resource page on the NEH website. You don't have to imitate them, but you can use them as an example of how someone else made a case for their project, and they can help you think about structure and form. For more tips on what makes a good proposal and the application process in general, please read the tips on applying for a preservation and access award at the top of our blog. You can't miss it when you go there. At the end of the presentation, when we enter q and I'll also share a link to that blog post in the chat. As I mentioned when discussing the narrative portion of the application, the program has a specific review criteria that we ask our panelists to consider when reading your proposal. Here are the criteria for PEG. As you can see, these criteria focus on the significance of the materials, the appropriateness of the work planned, and the qualifications of the staff. The criteria are included in the Notice of Funding Opportunity, and I recommend you print them out or keep them open on your computer so that you can have them top of mind as you are writing your application. Now, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that you start thinking about the logistics of submitting your application as soon as possible. Applications to NEH are submitted through a web portal called grants.gov. It is a fairly smooth system, but it would be good for you to spend some time getting familiar with it before you submit your application. 
Along with grants.gov, you will also need to be registered with SAM.gov or the System for Award Management. These registrations can take up to a month, so I recommend checking your registration status or working with your Office of Sponsored Projects, if you have one, early on in the application process so that you don't encounter any issues when it is time to submit your application. I'll note that in addition to grants.gov and SAM.gov accounts, uh, you will also want to have a login.gov account as well this year. It provides a unified login point to access government websites. Um, the setup process is very simple, but I just want you to be aware of this additional step. I will say that all of this may sound like a lot, but if you start now, you'll be giving yourself plenty of time, and there are lots of people willing to help you out. Honestly, I've answered many phone calls with people getting into grants.gov and needing help, and I'd be happy to do so for applicants again. And also, Sam, or excuse me, grants.gov has a 24 7 hotline. I've used it myself, and it's very good. Now, the next deadline is 11 59 p.m. Eastern Time on January 12, 2023. I recommend submitting your application a day or two in advance. Uh, that way, if your application is rejected for a technical reason, such as an invalid file type, you have a chance to correct the issue and resubmit before the deadline closes. Unfortunately, we are only able to give extensions in cases of major weather events, such as hurricanes or floods, or if the grants.gov system itself was down. Now, like I said, grants.gov has a 24-7 hotline, uh, so if you get started early, and if you've got questions, uh, give them a call. Now, please follow the requirements and naming conventions described in the NOFO carefully as you develop the PDFs that you will upload into grants.gov. Our notice of funding opportunity also includes instructions related to these different government websites. So for full details on grants.gov, SAM and login.gov, you can go to D3 or section D3 of the NOFO. Full details on how to submit in relation to those different uh, uh, websites is in section D4 of the NOFO. Now, every NEH grant application goes through a process of peer review. Applications are sorted into panels with regard to institution or collection type, for instance, historic house museums, public libraries, art collections, and library special collections. Then my colleagues and I identify people like you working in your field. Each review panel typically includes administrators and small organizations, content specialists, and conservators or other preservation specialists. They will evaluate the applications based on the criteria we went over, assign a rating and write comments. Uh, now, NEH staff then takes these panel recommendations to the July meeting of the National Council on the Humanities, pictured here, a board of 26 humanities professionals appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. The NEH chair, who has sole authority to grant funding, takes all these recommendations into account when making award decisions. All this means that your application is being evaluated by people like you, people who know the humanities and who understand the work you do. Once the chair has made final decisions, notifications will go out sometime in August. After awards are announced, all applicants may request to see their reviewers' written comments. These can prove helpful for improving a funded project or developing an application for resubmission if the application was not successful this time around. Preservation and access staff are always available to answer your questions, but here are a few we receive frequently that I'm happy to answer now. Many institutions call on us wondering if they would be considered small or mid-sized. Because we work with so many different institution types, like museums, libraries, and historical societies, it is not possible for us to give a clear-cut answer based on factors such as collection size, staff, or budget. Instead, we invite you to make the case for how your institution is small or mid-sized compared to other like organizations. I will also note, uh, just as I did before, that smaller units within larger institutions, such as a university museum or archive, generally fit this definition. And please note that this is not one of the review criteria. If you would like to see a list of more projects that have been funded through PAG, you can click the Search All Past Awards link toward the bottom of the NEH website page for PAG. Many applicants also ask us how they can 
find a consultant. Generally, you will want to find a preservation specialist or conservator whose experience is aligned with the type of collections you have and with your institution type. While we cannot recommend specific consultants for you, I do recommend looking at Section H of the NOFO that will have links and other information to help get you started. Now at this point, uh, it is 3.30 p.m. We've reserved plenty of time for questions. I'm sure Jacqueline has been fielding some uh, that have come through chat. I am going to leave this slide open for a little bit so that you have the phone number here um, to call us if you have questions, as well as the main uh, email account for preservation at preservation at NEH. Gov. We've been getting, I think, emails even from people who have uh, been in this webinar today. Uh, so please, we encourage you to reach out with us um, with additional questions. But for now, we have plenty of time to answer questions that come along here. So what I'm going to do, like I said, is leave uh, this screen up for a moment. I also recognize it's 3.30, so we must be switching our interpreters as well. So I'll pause to allow that to happen too. Okay, excellent. Let's see what we have in the chat. I see, um, yes, Jacqueline's been answering Hi. questions. Thank you. Hi, Sean, I'm here. Um, we just had a question that I wasn't sure how to answer, so I'm hoping that maybe you can kind of pitch in. And it is a question about what kinds of reformatting are acceptable. Would moving software from old floppy disks to more stable media count? Um, yeah, I think so, but I wanted to check with you. Yeah, no, that is a that is an excellent question. Um, and, you know, I, I will say the the reformatting work, it's eligible for those in federally declared disaster areas for the purposes of responding and recovering to that disaster. Um, so if this reformatting work is required to save those materials in the wake of that event, um, in that federally declared disaster area, by all means, reformatting methodology like that would be acceptable. So I'm glad that you reached out, uh, you, you sort of announced that to everybody, Jacqueline. Sure. Yeah, sure thing. Um, we've got a few more that just came in now, so I'm just going to go down the list. Um, from Linda, we are registered for SAM.gov and are trying to register for grants.gov. Can the same login be used for both, or do we have to create a different password? Mm, that is a good question. Uh, and so, um, because login.gov is now being used for these uh, two sites, I presume you'll be using your login.gov to link your two accounts. Um, but grants.gov has a separate registration process from SAM.gov, so they technically are 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 two separate um two separate sites. Uh, the one, of course, has to happen along with the other. So I hope that gives you some clarification there, Linda. And and if if you have follow up questions. Uh, please email us. Again, shepherding people through uh, the SAM.gov, grants.gov process, we are often the starting point for people, and then we also point people to grants.gov when we need to get, give some extra assistance, um, and you can also start there too. Yes, uh, they, so, they have their own help, right? Yeah, their they have their desk. own 24-7 hotline. Uh, so both access points, you know, whether you email us or you email them, you're going to get some help to, to navigate your specific issue. Great, thank you. Jennifer asks, we are interested in getting a preservation assessment for just one object that's important to the collection. Is that a competitive grant request? Ooh, that is a great <laughs> question, Jennifer. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll answer this in, in sort of like a two part way. I think the short answer is that there is definitely a path forward for a project like that. Um, first is that, you know, every object exists within a building that has its own preservation environment. Um, the, the whole comprehensive looking at the whole space through a general preservation assessment uh, could benefit all your collections in addition to this one item that is a particular focus to you. But if you are looking at the preservation needs of an individual object, a conservation assessment of that object uh, to understand its particular preservation outlook and treatment solutions for that object may be a more appropriate request just for a single object. So I'd look to a conservation assessment of an object where we tend to see 
um, applications come in for something a little bit more specific than all the collections in your, your building. Um, so I hope that answers your question as well. Great, thanks, Sean. I'm just going to continue to go down the list. It's a little hard to type in. Read the and questions that, at the same time. That's 100%. I, you know, I'll just answer add one little thing here um, just because I see that we are getting a lot of questions. Um, and so I'll say that if we don't get to your questions now, I'm going to make a spreadsheet of all the questions and we will get back to you. So please don't worry about that part. I'll also include my email at the end of the chat when before we close out um, and anybody can contact me directly as well. Um, so let's just keep going. Does PAG allow religious organizations to apply? Uh, my state. I, oh. If it's a 501c3 nonprofit, I think yes. Um, yeah. Right? It, it, yes. It, it would be fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, the when There is a funding restriction on the promotion of particular religious or political viewpoints. Um, but if you have an archive that's part of you know, a religious nonprofit, I think, you know, that would be fine. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, absolutely. Great. Um, I can answer this question from Alex. Is there a way to note in the budget that the cost of materials would be split? So the total cost would exceed the amount of the grant, so the remainder would need to be covered by our institution. So cost share is not a requirement of this program, but if you do find yourself in that situation, you would note that in the budget justification. Um, and then it would be be really obvious that those costs are are, you know, beyond what the program can cover, but that you would be covering the rest. I don't Thank know if you, you want to add anything to that, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that's that's very clear. Um, I might even add, I, actually, sorry, I guess I do have one point. Like clarity to our panelists can be helpful. And so even in the first question in the narrative about, you know, what um, activities would this project fund, you might even specifically say there, like right up front, we're covering the the extra cost of the project. Just so like, you know, the panelists, when they're reviewing the applications, fully understand that um, it's not a problem that the cost of the consultant for the project, um, you know, goes goes beyond uh, the total amount that the, the grant would, would fund. Great, thank you. Um, is there another award mechanism for undertaking preservation after an assessment is completed under this award? Hmm. Let me make sure I understand that question. I've got it right here as well, so I can read it again. I'm not sure I understand it. Um, no, I, Matthew, if you could um, maybe rephrase your question, that might help us uh, better guide you. But what I will say, I, I might be intuiting the question here. If you win your first award from this uh, program, you can apply again. Uh, and you can fund the things in your, uh, you know, say the preservation needs assessment report from uh, the assessment you funded in the first grant, and you can keep it coming back. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's no limit to the number of times you could apply or, or receive funding. No, we often have preservation assistant grants that we have applicants who come in multiple times and for separate activities. If you can't do them all and the $10,000 limit, you could do one where you have your preservation assessment and then come back for a second one where you purchase some equipment and supplies and things like that, or not equipment, but supplies um, and things like that. So hopefully that helps answer that. Um, Liza has another question that I am also not sure about. No, I just lost it because there's more stuff coming in the chat, but what is the timing on federal disaster areas? Mm. I I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, well, so our guidelines, I do not believe speak specifically to a timeline. I, you know, that is one that I think we'll need to follow up on. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so, uh, Liza, I'm going to just write your name down so I absolutely do not forget to email you directly about that. Um, so, I'm yeah, I'm definitely happy to speak to that one more specifically. Another 
or a question from Matthew Peake. If you do to your smaller institutions, poor record keeping, you don't have good usage or researcher statistics. How do you indicate usage of your collections for the narrative? That is a good question. And while it can definitely be helpful to have like good numbers, um, it, it's not a requirement in any way to have those numbers. Uh, so uh, it's really a matter of writing a compelling narrative. And that's where my like advice will go here. Um, if you can provide anecdotal evidence of good usage of the collections, maybe integration of the collections into public programming that you've found to be successful and well received, um, or you know of a project by maybe like, you know, a student researcher that was successful because they used your collections. These are all types of stories that you could use. So while numbers can be very helpful, uh, compelling and interesting anecdotes can also be useful. Okay, great. Um, from Valerie, she asks, would you expand on the idea of making collections available to the public from the tribal standpoint of some things are not for the general public? Mm, OK, I mean, that that is important to keep in mind that um, there are different uh, appropriate levels of access for tribal collections. Um, you know, I think I would like to take that one on and send you a specific response later. Um, but member, uh, you know, my I will say this, my impression being that they have audiences uh, that they are intended for that are not solely like within the institution and kept away, um, even if it's specific individuals uh, who may be served. So I don't want to I don't want you to think immediately like, oh, I don't think I can apply because this is somehow ruling me out. I would I would lean towards the side of um, of, of thinking, I bet I could make this work. So why don't I also follow up with you directly about that question? Uh, and Jacqueline, I don't know if you have any follow up thoughts on that one. Sure, or I do. Yeah, Valerie, I think that um, I mean, we would we wouldn't we would not require that. Um, your materials are to be made available to the general republic, understanding um, both confidentiality issues as well as um, kind of cultural issues as well. So I think that in your narrative, you would want to make a case for who are the people who are using these. And if they're within your tribe, that's that's your, their needs and their uses. And I think that that would be fine. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline, I think that's very well said. Thank you for pointing that out. Sure. Actually, now I, I feel like I may not need to follow up with that person because I think you've given a very clear and positive answer to them. Well, um, we're also we're also here for you. Um, if, if you want to discuss it more, certainly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is very true. Um, what is so our, our next question? Yeah, I'll keep going. Um, from Susan, our organization has a large amount of artifacts, furniture, and documents in our care. We are working to open our museum, but it is not open yet. We need to inventory everything to decide what to put on exhibit. Would that be allowed? Mm, you don't have them accessible now, but you have clear plans to make them accessible in the future? Mm-hmm. That's how I, mean, I read that. Yeah. I think if you make that that case clear in your narrative as well, that there are plans and an intention to make these collections available to the public um, and that perhaps, you know, the preservation assistance grant helps you move towards that direction. I think that's also that's probably appropriate as well. I think that would be appropriate. Yes, um, because it would help propel your your organization's mission forward, right? Mm -hmm. um, with the ultimate goal of making things available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Patrick asks, when will re the recording be posted um, and where will it be posted? I think it should go on the, the PAG web page, on the program web page, which um, I can again put in the chat. And I don't know how long it takes, Sean. It should be relatively quickly, right? Yeah, probably by the end of next week. And actually, everybody who's registered for this webinar will also receive an email with a link uh, to the YouTube video. Terrific. Thank you. Sam asks, we are in need of an engineer architect to help us better utilize our archival space by creating a report. Would that count as a consultant for preservation assistance? Mm, the better... Uh... SCHC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there there might be um, more that might be more applicable in our sustaining cultural heritage 
collections uh, grant. Um, but also, I mean, cons consultations for planning for a capital project that improves um, the preservation outlook of the collections. I, I believe one could still, if you look in the list of like the fundable activities that are listed, specific preservation activities um, in the notice of funding opportunity, it is listed there. Uh, and, and so it depends on the scale of your project as well, too. Is $10,000 enough for such an activity? Yeah, I was um, just going to, I was going to piggyback on that. If it's more than 10000 you might want to take a look at sustaining cultural heritage collections. Yeah, and in service of the preservation of the collections is really key there. Mm -hmm. Let's see who our next person is. Jennifer asks if the assessment indicates need for example, a new HVAC or for preservation of collections, is there eligibility for building needs as, such as this? So it's pretty similar to what um, to what we just mentioned. And somebody just asked if there's a link to the other grant that was mentioned. I think I just put it in the chat. Did it copy over okay? Yes, mm. so the one the the link that I put in at three forty four p.m. Mm. Okay, excellent. Uh, and you've answered that question as well. Yes, if you if you find that you have new HVAC needs, uh, sustaining cultural heritage collections is the program for an, a big HVAC system. Mm -hmm. Julie asks, how does NEH define a small institution? <laughs> so, uh, Julie, unfortunately, it is the an indefinable uh, trait, uh, what I, what you know, really counts as a small institution. Um, so you're going to have to make that case for yourself in the application. Uh, you know, it's not a review criteria, um, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. And try to frame um, whatever unit is managing the collections uh, and you know stewarding them. That's really the. Um, that's like the size, you know, that's the that's the unit that you should look at yourself as. Generally, we would we would encourage applicants to present themselves that way. So like in a university setting, the university could be quite large, but if you have special collections or an archive or a museum within that university, we would consider that probably a small institution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So but no hard and fast rules, this is true. Um, Emily asks, if we apply to have an assessment of our objects collection done, can we also ask for additional funding for caring for those items? For example, the assessment will point out areas of need. Could we also get supplies to start addressing one specific area from that assessment, or do we need to wait for the next grant to apply for that? Oh, that is a that is a great question. Um, so, uh, you know, if there's room in the budget, um, and you want some supplies alongside the assessment, there is a way to do that. The way that you would is that you would need the letter of commitment from the consultant to justify a need for like a preliminary list of supplies that they would have because they've talked to you. Um, and so again, it has to come in that letter of commitment from the consultant saying we believe these are the types of supplies that we'll need for the collection based on those preliminary discussions. Um, then the assessment happens and then you would buy those supplies. So it can technically all fit within one application if you do it that way. Um, or of course you can wait till the next uh, next grant too. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Joseph is also asking about you know, timelines for disaster areas. So we will get back to you on that one. It's a great question. Yeah. Uh, Clay asks, we're a small AA cultural heritage center and museum. How would you recommend getting a preservation assessment? Um, I had referred to earlier that in the NOFO, there is a section on page 35 of the PDF that includes a number of applicant resources. Um, that can help you find consultants. Um, we're not able to make specific recommendations of people, but for example, the American Institute of Conservation has a free guide to conservation services on its website. So I would suggest taking a look at those links um, and that will help you to find someone. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay. Um, Megan is also asking about tribal and public collections as they're working with NAGPRA. Um, so great, we can, I really, yeah, I think that's the question about 
you know, how public facing does it have to be? And I really do think that it's the, the most appropriate audiences for your collections are the ones that you are going to want to write about. Thank you, Jacqueline. That is well said. Robin asks, we applied for a different grant to help us with the preservation assessment. This is our first attempt to apply with NEH. Are we eligible now that we are in the actual preservation phase of our project? Oh, you've had a previous consultant and now you're ready to say buy some supplies or do some further work or but <laughs> help me out yes. here, but yes yeah, I no I, I i this is not an uncommon question uh robin so i'm glad you asked this um so you can get that uh like assessment anywhere uh to inform your um your next phase of your preservation project uh, so let's just say you privately funded a preservation assessment or got it from another grant, like I think you just mentioned, um, and it says we need these boxes. Well, you don't need to get a preservation assessment again from NEH to ask for the boxes, though I would recommend attaching the assessment report, you know, the relevant pieces of it that recommend those things that you're asking for to the application so that the reviewers understand where your request is coming from. And there is a question within the application that says, have you ever had a preservation assessment? It's not a requirement, but that would be the place to note it. Good point, yes. Uh, how, Liza asks, how do you respond to a digitization and access via a website as a strategy to make collections available to the public? Hmm. I think I know what you're asking here, Liza. Um, so in terms of, you know, that making collections available to the public type of, of, of question, um, if things are digitized and accessible online as an access point, that is an appropriate kind of access to collections. But again, you can't fund digitization through this program unless it's in a federally declared disaster area and it's for the purposes of saving those collections. Perhaps similarly, Dina asks, curious as to the rationale for covering only external storage media versus cloud storage. Mm, uh, Dina, that is a very good choice. Uh, good, good question. Um, so, the one of the reasons is that uh, oftentimes cloud services that uh, provide like a preservation level of quality of of digital storage often have integrated in them. Uh, other types of services that emphasize providing access to collections, such as like a content management system built into it, uh, which really falls outside the scope of the preservation assistance grant program to sort of like fund the development and implementation of like a digital asset management system that would also be providing access to your collections. If you're looking for a program that's going to help you like get your collections not only stored online in the cloud, but made accessible uh, online, uh, you'd really want to look at our Humanities Collections and Reference Resources Program, which has both a planning level and an implementation level. And so really the emphasis on, on you know, that physical storage media or even network attached storage that's you know physical storage, um, but not in the cloud, um, is to sort of avoid that uh, creep into the direction of like new systems that pr like provide an online level of access that would be outside the scope of this program. Karen asks, we have been given a collection of historical materials related to our organization, organizational mission that have not been cataloged. Could we apply for a PAG to hire a consultant to help us figure out how to best move forward with organizing the collection for public sharing? Mm, so, so the work of cataloging, uh, that, and this is actually a little connected to the last answer I gave, um, that type of work that is really the focus of, of enhancing access to the collections by better cataloging, arranging, or describing the materials, that's really the Humanities Collections and Reference Resources Grant Program. Um, maybe a foundations level application, uh, which is like our planning level in that program, uh, a consultant could certainly help you develop a plan to 
better provide access to those collections, such as developing cataloging procedures. Great. Uh, Christine, I answered you in the chat, but since it's applicable to everyone, how often are these grants, do they become available? Um, they're once a year, so the application deadline is in January, and then this, that's for projects usually starting in September. Sean, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, uh, I think, you know, okay. the annual, that's fine, yeah. Annual cycle, yes. Uh, Kathy asks, our preservation assessment was performed more than five years ago. Is there a time limit on how current the assessment needs to be? Mm, that's a great question. There is technically no time limit. Um, what I will say is that sort of like in the general best practices consideration, like uh, uh, an assessment really needs to like be redone between five and 10 years after the last time you got one. Um, if the, you know, and again, this doesn't make you ineligible, to apply for something based on that assessment, but if you do decide to apply for something based on that assessment, um, I would recommend that you try to make the case for why those um, those recommendations are still relevant to you. Um, also, keeping in mind that you know best practices in preservation can change, um, and so the you know this is to say that there's no there's no time limit. Um, you will just have to make a case for um how it's relevant and it, it connects basically to your like competitiveness um but again if you can make the case it's certainly certainly appropriate yeah to add some context to that i only saw kathy's second question a moment later after i read that aloud but she says that they'd be applying for storage and protective items so if the needs haven't changed i think that the timeline is is less relevant right yeah if you're if your needs are still the same for those collections, you you could do that. Great. Matthew asks, would converting media like VHS tapes or audio tapes to a more stable and accessible format be considered digitization? Mm, yes, Matthew. Um, so that does count as a form of digitization. Uh, Liza would like the URL to the Humanities Collections and Reference Resources. I can get you that. I think that might be. I, I think that might be all of the questions that I have. I'm oh. gonna like scroll up just a little bit. I for some reason I could swear I saw one missing, but I also noticed you were giving the thumbs up to answered ones, which makes this easy. Yes, to see. that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> Uh, yes. Jacob asked about old slides too. Yes, Jacob, that would be considered digitization as well. I'm sorry to say. Here is the link for humanities collections and reference resources. Um, while you're scrolling, I'm going to, I just had another question from Michael. Would indexing archival records make the information more pertinent to be covered under this grant? Mm. Uh, indexing is not a, a, a an allowable activity for this grant. Um, if you do it pr prior to applying, it might help bolster the significance of the material. But John, do you want to add to that? No, I think that's well said. And, uh, you know, I'll just point it to be um, that's like a humanities collections and reference resources activity, the access side of things. Yes. And since we're getting close, kind of close to the end, or the, the questions have slowed to a trickle. I'll again put my email address in the chat. Um, you're welcome. If, if I somehow missed your missed your question, I'm just scrolling through as well. Or any other last minute questions, we are happy to help. Yes, I think I promised uh, to add one of the links to those blog posts um, into the chat. So let me do that as well. Um, one moment while I go dig that up in our final moments here. You'll also Thanks. see the preservation at neh.gov email address that will reach all of us and therefore we can help you too. But yeah, go ahead, Sean. Yep, there you go. Another just just throwing into the chat the blog post um, on tips to apply. Perfect. Um, uh, well, I appreciate the kind words that are coming in. I'm glad you liked the webinar. I'd love to see uh, your names on applications uh, from, you know, all of your names on these applications coming in in January. Um, so can't wait to uh, can't wait to hear from you. Um, I think uh, it's it's time to close down.
So thanks, thanks again, everybody. I'm going to stop our recording. Feel free to um, to leave the meeting. If you've got other questions, give us a call. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Sean. Mm -hmm.